Okay. So this is all the single phase stuff kind of summarized. And this covers a lot of it, right? Again, this is in the notes, both in the lecture slides as well as the notes, right? Um, all the different ways that you could think to, to try to capture um, the real and reactive power going into some impedance, okay? All right, what we, what we did last time was we talked about a three-phase system, right? So this is, this is what I would talk about as a typical three-phase load, all right? So, so an example is a motor, um, and this guy here would be something we're going to define later on called an induction motor, all right? And it's got three phases. How is it connected, delta or y? I don't know. I don't care. Okay. It's got, <clears throat> if I look at what comes out of it, it's got three wires that come out of the side of it. All right. Whether they're delta, whether they're y, it doesn't matter. All right. So I, I don't get too worried about what are the delta currents and what are the y currents and all that sort of stuff. And my, when you think about a motor, that's your typical type of load. You don't think about how it's connected. You just think about it from its terminals. All right, so these are the relationships between VAN, VBN, and VCN. I tried to do this general. So I said, if this guy has an angle 5V, then these are all related to it, okay? And the important thing is, what's true about the phase shift between the voltage and the current on A phase? Well, what is that? What's the phase shift between V? A, N, and I, A. What's that phase shift? It's the same as what angle? Impedance angle, right? What is it on VBN and IB? It's the impedance angle. VCN and IC, it's the impedance angle, right? So basically, it's the impedance angle for all of those, okay? Um, now, the key thing, right, is VAB, VBC, VCA, right? So what does this mean here? If I were to sketch this guy, let's say, let's say VAN has an angle of 30 degrees. Let's say this is VAN and this is 30 degrees. Where would VAB be? 60 degrees and it would be bigger, right? So it'd be 60 degrees and he would be square root of three bigger, right? So it's 30 degrees. So is this, is this leading? Is VAB leading VAN or lagging it? So VAB, he is, VAB is leading VAN, right? And I, the reason I say that is it's more positive, right? What is more, which direction is positive angle? Counterclockwise, right? So angles increase that way. So, VAB is 30 degrees ahead of VAN, so it leads it by 30 degrees, okay? All right. So that's our basic three-phase stuff. If I said to you, all right, some of you guys have already, you already know how to do this and you jumped into the homework. Um, we ended with this last time. If I, if I want to try to find the power into this load, and I know this stuff here, if I said to you, how would I get the power into this thing, the total complex power, how would you do it? I want the complex power into that thing. It's, yeah, the, the well, it doesn't matter, load or source. Yeah, add up the power for each one, right? So it'd be whatever SA is plus whatever SB is plus whatever SC is, okay? All right, <clears throat> and what's that work out to be? If I, if I plug in what SA, so first of all, how would I get SA from the variables VAN and IA that I've written here. Well, it would just simply be VAN times IA like that, right? What did I do wrong? Conjugate, Conjugate right? And SB would be the same thing. So it'd be VBN times IB conjugate. SC would be similar, right? So I get the whole thing. What's that work out to be? If I if I do this, basically it works out to be three times V, three times any one of them, right? So basically it'd be three times VAN times IA conjugate. Or sometimes we write this as three times VAN IA conjugate or IA magnitude 
times the angle of the impedance, right? Where the angle of the impedance is the difference between the two. Like that, okay? Now, to be, to be fair, um, in reality, the one thing you come across more likely Everything that, first of all, everything that applied in single phase applies to three phase. There's really no difference, right? It's all the same stuff. Um, the thing that we sometimes do is if I take this relationship here, so I just said that S, the complex power, is three times the magnitude of VAN times the magnitude of IA times the angle of the, or not times, with an A, this, this is a vector. This is its magnitude. And this is its um, angle, right? That's actually not the most common way to see it. The most common way to see it is to make this um, substitution right here, right? What, what's that VAN, the magnitude of the vector VAN is the magnitude of VAB divided by the square root of three. If I plug that into here, what's that gonna turn this expression into? Well, I'm gonna have three over the square root of three. What's three over the square root of three? Just, just square root of three, yeah. Square root of three times magnitude VAB times IA angle Z. All right, so we, so we use that expression probably most commonly. If I had to talk about the expression that I use probably the most, it's um, where I'm trying to figure out the power I know what the voltage line to line is. In other words, I know what VAB is. I know what IA is. And I guess an angle. All right. In reality, you almost never know the angle. All right. You know, the, you, you guess what the angle is going to be. Okay. Any question, Musa? Okay. All right. So so basically, in, in summary, that's, that's it. This is in the notes as well. Um, <clears throat> basically, these relationships that apply. Um, it's, you know, exactly what you've, um, seen, um, in the past, you've seen this in, in 2112 is a pretty similar, similar setup to what you would have. Okay. All right. So let's do an example. Okay. Kind of similar to, I think similar to problem one, uh, in the homework, right? So I've got Basically, in this case, one thing I don't have is I don't have any kind of impedance in those lines. I basically just have a three-phase source, and I got two loads in parallel, okay? And I'm told that load one has 10 kilowatts at a power factor of 0.85 lagging and 12 kilowatts at a power factor of 0.9 leading on the other one, okay? That's kind of the best. In, in reality, that's kind of the measurements that you typically get um, is the, the loads absorbing that much power and you, you, you kind of sort of know what its power factor is, okay? Um, all right, so the question here is, I want to know these things. What's the complex power in each case? I guess what I mean here is each, to be clear, each load, okay? What's the total complex power? What's the currents in each load? And what's what are the line currents, okay? All right, so let's let's go through that here if we can. All right, so let's start with the complex power in each load. So let's do load one. So load one, I was told its power, I'll call it P1, is 10 kW. And I was told that its power factor is 0.85 lagging. Okay. Now, lagging means that if I talked about the impedance of this load, is this, what kind of impedance is this load? Inductive. inductive, okay, he's inductive, which means that the current lags the voltage, right? That's where the term comes from, all right? So when we do power, that means that the angle of the impedance, which is the same as the angle of the vector, so the, so remember the complex power vector is this guy, he's whatever the magnitude of S is with an angle of phi sub Z. So is phi sub Z, is that positive or negative? positive because I have an inductive load, right? So it's, this guy is going to have J omega L, this guy's R, this thing's going to have a positive angle if you try to get the angle of that impedance, okay? So 
I draw my triangle like this. Okay. So in this case, which side of the triangle here do I know? Here's here's the magnitude of S. All right. Which side of the triangle do I know? Not the hypotenuse. The bottom line. Yeah, the real part. I know P. All right. So I know P is 10 kW. Like that. And I know something else, right? What else do I know? Exactly. I know this angle here. This guy's phi Z. All right. So phi Z is inverse cosine of 0.85 of the power factor. Okay. So if I do the math on that, that works out to be 31.7883 degrees. And I'm bad. I shouldn't probably keep that to four decimal points. I don't know what 0.7883 degrees looks like. It's basically zero. All right, so I, I should probably round it down, right? This, this, but it's 31.7883 degrees. I kept it that way. All right, so this guy is 31.7883 degrees. Okay. All right, so now if I want to get the total complex power, what do I, what do I do? What am I missing? Q. All right, so how do I get my Q here? Well, I could use the tangent function, maybe, I guess. Um, I know what the, so let's see, what do I know? I know Q would be equal to the magnitude of S times what? Yeah, the sine of phi Z. All right, and do I know what the magnitude of S is? Yeah, so, so I know that P, right, so P, equals the magnitude of S times the cosine of power factor, or cosine of the angle, sorry. Cosine of the angle is the power factor. So this guy is P divided by the power factor. So this guy works out to be, if I do the math, 11.765 K, what, what units? K what? Volt amps, All right, volt amps, okay. Not K bars, volt, volt amps, right? If I do my Q, my Q, I, I, if I plug in all the variables that I got here, this guy's going to work out to be 6.1974 K bars, volt amps reactive. Okay. So my overall P plus JQ works out to be 10 KW plus J times. 6.1974 K bars. All right. Questions about how I did that? Okay. All right. Good. Now let's do the, let's do load number two. All right. Load number two. What do we know about that? He said he was 12 KWs at 0.9 leading. Okay. All right. 0.9 leading. So let's see. So I've got, the P is 12 kW, and the power factor is 0.9 leading. All right, so what do I do with that? Yeah, find the angle. Now, before I do that, I was what's leading going to mean here? What type of load do I have? Capacitive. What's the angle of a capacitive load? Negative. So that changes the vector I draw, right? So here's P now. And I say that this guy is going down. The magnitude of S is going down. This angle, phi sub Z, it's less than zero, but I guess in particular, it's between zero and negative 90 is where it's going to be. If it, in other words, if it was a pure capacitor, it would be negative 90 degrees. But if there's some resistance, it's going to be somewhere between zero and negative 90. Okay. All right. So it's, it's shifted down like that. All right. It's the same exact process that I did for the last one, right? So I say, this is where it gets tricky. So I can't just say power factor is 0 0.9 is equal to the cosine of phi z. That's, that's not going to work here. I'll call it phi z2, I guess. That's not going to work here, right? I got to be careful. I got to put the minus sign in by hand. 
right? I have to use my knowledge of this. The problem is that the cosine function, whether it's in the first quadrant or the fourth quadrant, doesn't, it's the same, right? So in this case, my phi z ends up being negative cosine inverse of 0.9. All right, so it's up to me to take care of that if it's capacitive, okay? So that works out to be, in this case, for number two, negative 25 degrees, negative 25.8419 degrees. All right, now I'm not gonna go through the process again. It gets old and boring pretty fast. I'm gonna take all the same process I did before, and I'm gonna get that the power, complex power for this guy is 12 kW minus J times 5.8. 119k bar. Okay, so there's there's my total. And I could also write that as a vector, right? I could say this guy's got a magnitude and an angle if I wanted to. All right, now, it then asks me, okay, what's the total complex power? All right, so how do I get the total complex power? I add those two things. All right, so I add those two things. If I do that, if I add them up, I'm going to get... The total complex power, S1 plus S2. First of all, let's let's add, let's do the easy part of that. If I add S1 plus S2, what's the real part of that? 22 kW, right? One's 10, one's 12. So that makes it 22 because the real parts add. 22 kW, and then if I combine them, plus point. So 385.58 VARs. So in combination, what do they look like? Right? In other words, these two loads in parallel, do they look inductive or capacitive? Inductive. How can you tell it's inductive? Because the Q is positive here, right? This guy's in the first quadrant, so that's an inductive load. He's got a positive phi Z, okay? All right, so. When they have a J on there, though? Or not. Uh, it would yeah there would be a j there yeah right so that guy ends up in the in the first quadrant okay now the other question to ask me is what are the currents in each load and what are the line currents okay and we were told that vab has this 480 angle 30 degrees okay all right so <clears throat> um let's do for load number one Okay, for load number one, we had that S1 was 12 kW plus J times 6.1974 kVars, which is 11.765 kVA with an angle of 31.788 three degrees and what i want to find is the current and i always start with ia okay so where do i start with this how do i find this um yeah yeah you're right it is it is it doesn't change the s though the s is still 11.765 All right, so how do I figure out I sub A? Well, how do we do this with a single phase problem? What was the relationship for a single phase problem? What would you do with a single phase problem? Yeah, so I have that relationship in single phase. You would say S is, is, is what? Voltage times complex conjugate of the current, right? So in this case, it's a little bit different, right? All right, a little bit different. So I've got, go back to our relationships here. So we had two relationships that I came up with. All right. And I should be really careful. That's the magnitude of the, so I, well, I guess I did. It's a little, maybe a little bit unclear, but if I'm looking at this, three times VAN, the vector times IA conjugate is the complex power 
and I've said that the magnitude of I A is just I, right? So I've got two formulas here, basically three times the magnitude of the V A N times the magnitude of I with an angle of Z, or the square root of three times the magnitude of the um, line to line voltage, okay? Times the magnitude of the current. So in this case, what was I given in this problem? VAB, all right? So what I'm gonna do to try to approach this is I'm gonna say, well, the S that I was given for this load is the square root of three times the magnitude of VAB times the magnitude of I, A, times, well, not times, but with, it's that vector with an angle phi z, okay? And I guess specifically phi z one, okay? All right, so how do I approach this, right? So the first thing I can do is I can do magnitudes, right? So what's, what's the magnitude of this expression here? What's the magnitude of that thing? Yeah, it's 11.765 kVA is equal to, what is it in terms of those variables right there? Well, it's square root of three times what? Magnitude of VAB and the angle of IA, right? And I know what VAB is, right? VAB, I was told, was what? Yeah, if I go back to my problem statement here, it's 480. So I know this guy is 480. And the magnitude of IA, I can then solve for, right? Now it's just chugging through the math. If I chug through the math on that, I get that the magnitude of IA is going to work out to be what? I end up with 14.1507 amps. Okay, about 14 amps, okay. Now, how do I go ahead and get the, the angle here? Phi, okay, so phi z, so phi z1 here is equal to the angle of the voltage. And I don't like ever remembering that. I What I do is I basically say to myself, this came out of Ohm's law, right? Where I say that v a n, equals I A times Z, like that. If I if I think of this in terms of angles, I get this relationship right here, okay? So what is phi Z1? Well, we know what that is. That's the 31.7883 degrees. What's phi V? Yeah, why isn't it 30? I thought VAB was this. It's the angle of VAN, right? So if VAB is 30 degrees, VAN has what angle? VAN is 30 degrees behind it. So it's got an angle of zero, okay? All right, so this guy is zero. This is minus phi I. And I get that phi I is negative 31.7883 degrees like that okay that makes sense um if i if i then asked you okay well i want to get what is uh, and i think pr problem one on the homework was the question that rachel asked earlier right so it only asked you for the magnitude there but if i said okay well i want to get the phasers for ib and ic how do i get them how do i get those what's the magnitudes of ib and ic same Right. What about the angles? Yeah, you got to subtract 120 and then subtract 240. Now, one one thing you may have noticed in, in some of the homework problems is I always ask for the angle between minus 180 and plus 180. And so that's going to screw you up later. You're going to think you're right and you're going to sit there and you enter it 10 times thinking that you're thinking I'm crazy. Right. That means that if I get a number, like if I, if I go through this here, for instance, I'm going to get that I, I1C would be 
zero seven amps with an angle of negative two hundred and seventy one point seven eight eight three degrees. Matt, I'm just going to tell you that's wrong because I asked for the angle between minus one eighty and plus one eighty. So what is that? What is the actual value that you put in? Yeah, this guy's the same as being 91 degrees, right? Negative 270, where is negative 270? That's all, so I drew the picture. Negative 270 would be over here. I go this direction to get to negative 270, right? So this is the same as basically with 271, it works out to be 91 degrees, okay? All right, <clears throat> anyway. So, so hopefully you guys see that. So you can add 360 to it to get to get that. All right. If I do the same, if I, I don't I'm going to bore myself to death if I go through load two and, and the total, but it's basically the same basic process. All right. Now, <clears throat> what if I ask you something like this? If I've got so the total combination of those loads, we said I had S equal to, and what did I say it was? What was the combination of them? I said it was 22 kW and I had 385.58 VARs. That's pretty darn close to unity power factor, right? But let's say I wanted to make it unity power factor. So I've got basically a set of lines going out here to my loads. And one thing we're gonna talk about later, nobody draws a picture like this in practice. They don't draw three lines coming out to the load. They draw something called a one line diagram. All right. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. So I've got my two loads here in parallel. All right. What would I do to get this guy to unity power factor? In other words, if I wanted the power on this thing to be just 22 KW, what would I do? Put capacitors in here. Now, where, how would I hook those capacitors up? Well, what I what I would do is they would go in parallel, just like they do in single phase, right? And the assumption would be you'd put them in like this. So here's one here. It's the same process you used in the last homework, right? Except what? How much, if you, so first of all, how much Q is needed from the capacitors? So Q capacitor needs to be what to make this guy unity power factor? Yeah, negative 385.58, right, is how much Q I need. All right. That's how much Q from the capacitors. So how much does each capacitor need to give me? A third of that. All right. Each capacitor would need to give me one third of that. So the way I would look at this is I would say for for Q, I don't know, if I call this C1, I would say QC1 is, you know, at least the magnitude of it is 385.58 divided by three, right? And then just like we did in the single phase stuff, I look at that and I say, well, that's What's the voltage across this guy? What's the voltage across C1 in that picture? Well, I guess I didn't say, let's call this guy A, let's call this B, let's call that C. So what's the voltage across capacitor C1? If this, if this line right here is A, VAN, right? So this guy is VAN squared divided by the impedance of the capacitor, like that. So you can find what the what any one of those individual capacitors needs to be. If the loads are balanced, then the neutral doesn't even need to be there. But they would technically, yeah, there would be one neutral running back between all of them. But if the loads are truly balanced, it's as if they all have their own neutral that's not connected to each other. They could be, all right, but they don't have to be. Now, in reality, that's never that never happens. 
So there's always a neutral. There's always some current in the neutral. Yeah. The delta, you don't ever need a neutral. Yeah. If you, you know, if you look at like my initial picture here in a motor, all right, where a motor is pretty well balanced, a motor, and that's why it's the way of thinking about it. A motor never has a neutral ever. All right. The only time I ever saw a, a neutral on a motor was when we specifically went to Aardvark Motors and asked them. That was literally the name of the company, Aardvark Motors, and asked them to put a neutral into it. I have never seen a commercial motor that you can buy that has one. Um, and that's those are your most typical three-phase loads that you deal with are motors. All right. So whether it's Y or, or neutral, doesn't Y or delta, it doesn't matter. All right. Again, I'm not going to get too beyond that. I'm not going to get too focused on, you know, if I have a delta load to a Y load, if I want to convert it and get the currents and all that, I, I don't really care. Um, because for the most part, like I said, when you connect a load up, this is what you have. It's a load. It's connected to the grid. Okay. All right. Okay. And then I, I put this in the notes too, um, just basically the code that I used. Um, if you want to just kind of compare to see, you know, how, how I did those specific calculations. All right. All right. So I want to shift gears now and talk about sort of the, the core material that um, we're going to get into, which is, which is really, we got to talk about magnetics because the machines that we use are all magnetics. So this is, this is a picture here of this thing I called an induction machine, induction motor. All right, and, and what we said is th this is an energy conversion device. And this guy has two ports. It's got energy that goes in, energy in, and energy out. All right. So in this case, I showed an electric machine. That's my general term for basically what I would call uh, a motor or generator. This guy's a generator, which means which, so I've got an electrical port and a mechanical port. The mechanical port is basically the shaft of the machine, right? The electrical port is that box up at the top, okay? If I've got a generator, where is the, which, which side is the energy going into? The mechanical, right? So in other words, I would have a turbine of some sort that would be spinning that thing. If it's a nuclear plant, or if it's a coal plant, that would that would be coming from a turbine that's driven by steam pressure. And if that was coming at a gas plant, that would be uh, coming from combusting gas. Okay. The if I if I turn this thing into a motor, what would be the difference? Where would the energy go in? Electrical port, and it would come out of the mechanical port, meaning it could turn a pump or it could turn a fan or something like that. Okay. All right, and so I, I wrote here the, the terminal variables. When we get to this, I have a voltage and a current that I have at the electrical terminals. I got a, what are those two things here? Omega and capital T. We're gonna talk about those a lot more. Speed and torque, all right? Because this guy produces torque and he produces speed. All right, um, now we're gonna deal with some other things. And so we're gonna deal with this guy towards the end. I think it's important to start talking about some of the newer technologies as well. Um, first guy we're going to talk about is this guy, transformers. All right. Now, in this case, I'd have an input port, which is basically the primary, and an output port, which is the secondary. So it's electrical energy in, electrical energy out. Okay. So it's, but it's just doing a conversion between basically two voltage levels, right? Is usually what's going on. Now, both this transformer and this motor, what's inside of them? Fundamentally, there's, What's that? Well, there's losses that happen inside that thing. But if I talk about what's it made of, right? Coils of wire, and those coils of wire are around what kind of material? Yeah, a, a, yeah. So you, a couple of things. So somebody said magnetic, and then I heard ferrous material. So it's it's some sort of usually a ferrous material, magnetic material, which means that it's somehow like it's somehow based off of iron, iron or steel. Okay, um, and why do we deal with magnetics? All right, so magnetics is kind of the, the, I said, you know, kind of a class like this, which is, I guess, officially energy conversion devices is the official title of it. When I first started at UNCC, it was electromagnetic devices. 
So we changed the title of it to reflect the fact that electromagnetic devices are not the only type of energy conversion device, right? I could have something like that solar panel. But for a long time, we focused on magnetics because magnetics are pretty amazing in terms of what they're able to do, okay? So two basic things that we're going to deal with from this point forward, and they're two pretty basic concepts, right? Um, so I have that picture right there where I've got a magnet, two magnets that are facing each other. And then I put a wire on a battery. All right, bad idea. Don't put a wire on a battery. Um, but if I if I did this, so we're going to talk about B fields and H fields and all that kind of good stuff here in a second. But if I, where's the magnetic field? If I've got a North Pole here and a South Pole here. Where's the magnetic field? Wait, well, not, not against each other. Well, towards each other. Yeah. And so starting where and ending where. So first of all, let's just back up for a second. If I had a magnet by itself, just like free in space, right? And there's a North Pole and a South Pole. Where are the magnetic field lines? All right. They come from the North and to the South like that. They would, then they would loop around like that. What's true about magnetic field lines? Um, well, they're always closed. So if I have, if I have a wire, so let's, let's say I had a wire in space, right? Let's say, uh, my pen here is a wire, right? There's, where's the magnetic field lines? If I had a current going this way, where would the, it, yeah, it would go around. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's basically, yeah, what, what rule do I use to figure out the direction of it? right hand rule? So I put my thumb in the direction of the current and then my, my fingers go around and tell me the tell me where the field is and the field lines basically go around it in a circle i say those field lines are closed right what's that mean to say that they're closed what's that yeah, you can say it that way yeah yeah we're not going to talk about that i'm not going to talk about divergences in here unless you really want to i don't i'm not i don't want to stay away from the calculus as much as i can all right um there's a Around this thing, yeah, the divergence is zero. The div of B is zero, which means the field lines are closed on themselves, which is very simple from a physics perspective. If I had a charge, right? And you said there's an electric field coming out of the charge. What happens to the field lines? The electric field lines just go off to infinity, right? For, for a magnetic field, they're always closed on themselves. So they start and end at a point. They basically form a circle, some sort of closed loop, right? Let's not get too lost on that. If I if I basically take a take a north and a south pole and put them together, right? What do they do? They go from this north to this south, right? Technically, they come back out again and around, but between the north and the south, they go like that. Okay. And in fact, if I take two magnets and put them together, a north pole and a south pole, what are they going to want to do? They're going to want to smack together. Okay. And so this becomes a hard demo to try to do, right? But I have a magnetic field, which I'm going to call B, which is going from north to south. Now we're talking about this idea a lot more later, but if what's going to happen if I have a current? The current's going to leave the positive terminal of that battery. So if I want to figure out what's going to happen to that wire, first of all, without getting into the details of it, what's going to happen to that wire? It's going to move, all right? So, and I can use, there's another right-hand rule to say, well, if I's going this way and B's going that way, this guy's going to go up, all right? We're going to get to that later. Important thing is what? If I put a current into a magnetic field, what's the wire do? It moves, all right? Yeah, there, well, so a wire in a magnetic field moves. That's the basic premise of a motor. Right. So what am I going to do in a motor? So Tesla's big idea was basically to say, okay, well, if I can, if I can make a, a magnetic field move and I put a current carrying wire into that magnetic field, what's that current carrying wire going to do? Well, it's, if I, it's in a motor, I can show my, I mean, yeah, there's some voltage generation, but the key thing is if I put a current, if I put a wire with a current into a magnetic field, the wire is going to move. And if I make the field move, the wire is going to try to follow it. They're never going to line up perfectly, but they're going to follow each other. So we're going to see this later. If I take, if I took those magnets and kept, let's say I kept moving those magnets up, 
right? What would the wire do? The wire would keep rising up with it, okay? That's the basic premise that makes a motor work, is you keep moving the field that you, you have, you create a field and you keep making the wire try to follow it and you rotate the field, okay? So somehow, somehow inside this motor, there's a field that's going around and around and around and around trying to make the rotor follow it, okay? So we'll, we'll talk about that idea. We'll, we'll see some visualizations of that later because it's a pretty simple idea once you start to get it. Now, the other thing, which gets to the second point, I think that you were making there is, if, so on the generator side, if I place a wire inside of a magnetic field, what happens? So if I place the loop of wire, so let's just say I had a loop of wire like this and I place it in a magnetic field. So let's say I draw these X's like this. Those X's tell me a direction of a field. Which direction is that field if I draw X's like that? Into the page, all right, into the page. What's gonna happen at the terminals of this thing here? Got all kinds of thoughts, right hand rules and is it stationary? What's gonna happen at those at those terminals? But in general, it's gonna that's what's gonna induce voltage on that one, right? There will be a voltage induced on that guy. Huh. <clears throat> well, what is there's maybe some motion, there's all sorts of things that might happen. The key thing is I'm gonna get a voltage at those terminals. Is there gonna be a current? There gonna be a current in that wire? If it's open, then no, all right? But there is gonna be a voltage there, okay? There is a voltage that'll be generated here at these terminals. Now, what's the caveat? Let's say that B field is constant. In other words, let's say the B field is, I don't know, three Tesla. That's a lot of Tesla, all right? Let's say that B field is three Tesla. Would there be a voltage? Okay, so fair. So there's, there's. We're not going to do. We're not going to do divergences and gradients and curls and stuff like that. But we wanna, what is Faraday's law? What does Faraday's law tell me in words? Yeah, that's you're, you're getting the right, the right idea. Faraday's law in, in tells me in words. If I place a wire into a changing magnetic field, I will induce a voltage in that wire. And I could make that changing magnetic field by moving a magnet. But just in general, if I place a wire into a changing magnetic field, then I induce a voltage. Okay. What's Ampere's law tell me? All right, we we're gonna get we're gonna get into to get lost on that stuff real quick. First, the, the main thing is I, there's there's not a whole lot to say about this just yet, but these are the two basic principles we're gonna use. If I want to make something move, I put a wire in and I put a current into that wire and I put that wire into a magnetic field. That's gonna make that wire move. If I move the magnetic field, the wire's gonna move with it. And that's how the basic premise of how a motor works. For a generator, basically, I generate a voltage by placing that wire into a changing magnetic field. Changing means that it has, yeah, when I say changing, what do I mean by changing? Yeah, it has a dB by dt. Yeah, so I put a coil of wire into a DC field, I think it'd be nothing there, okay? Be zero volts on that wire. But if I put it into a changing magnetic field, like a 60 Hertz field, then there's going to be a voltage that's induced. All right. So we're, we're going to try that. All right. And that's the basic principle by which anything moves, right? So I could, for, as an example, this is a side view of a speaker, right? So if, you, if you, you've looked at a speaker before, right? So what's inside of it is, is there's one magnet that goes around the outside, and then there's a magnet in the middle. So there's a magnetic field that goes from north to south, and you put a current into a set of wires, there's a coil that's in the center of that speaker, right? What the current flowing through these things is directly related to the audio signal that you wanna hear, right? And so what's gonna happen if I put a current carrying wire into that magnetic field? What's gonna happen to those wires? They're gonna move back and forth, 
right? And notice they're connected to this cone out here. This is the cone. So what's that going to do? It's going to move that cone back and forth, which does what? It pushes on the air, launching air waves out, hitting your, basically doing the same thing then on your eardrums. Your eardrums move back and forth. And then there's a current that basically comes out of your, out of your ears somehow. I'm not going to get into how that works, right? But it's, it's basically the reverse process, okay? All right, so it's fundamental premise of how we can make motion happen, right? Is, is through this sort of basic idea. All right, <clears throat> so the basics of magnetics that we got to kind of think about here. So we talk about H fields and B fields, and we talk about flux, all right? Now, there's all kinds of weird and wacky units for this. Let's see if you guys, so the SI units, this is one area where electrical engineers, we, you know, we're used to using SI units, volts and amps and ohms. Um, but sometimes you get mixed units for these things, okay? H field. What are the basic units of H field? Amps per meter. Okay. What about B fields? Teslas. All right. And what about flux? This guy here is flux. What's this guy? What's that? So let's, let's define flux for a second. Okay, flux would basically be if I had, I'm gonna jump myself ahead here for a second, right? So I got a coil of wire with a B field going through it. Okay, flux, is the total amount of magnetic field going through that thing. So I want to, I want to count the B field lines that go through it. Okay. So how, how do I do that? Well, I say that this coil here is a surface S, right? He's a surface S, right? And I, and I do what? Calculate B dot DA. All right, again, I'm not going to get lost in the calculus. We get rid of the calculus as quickly as we can, all right? Because it loses us on the important stuff, all right? So the total amount of field going through that thing is B dot DA. And in fact, if, if B is not a function of space and area is not a function of space, then this can just become B times A, all right? And that's, that's what we're going to do. It's mostly going to be B times A. All right, which means this guy has the units of it are everybody's favorite Weber's, right? Or Tesla meter squared. All right. Not quite honestly, you don't you you don't talk about those very often. All right. All right. So a couple of things for for us. How does H how do H and B relate to each other? So B, the vector B, and I guess I think of vectors, I should really do them with the little arrows over top. This is different than a phaser, right? When I'm saying this is different than a phaser. This guy's a vector, but it's not a phaser. Phasers have a time meaning. B has a space meaning, right? And that's why I'm drawing that arrow on top of it. Just like physics, it's a space meaning. Again, I'm not going to get too lost in vectors and stuff like that. I want to get to the meaning of the physics and not too lost on the calc stuff. How does that relate to H? How do B and H relate? All right, B equals mu times H. Okay, B equals mu times H. Now we find out, I'm not going to focus a lot on this. All right, um, if I... That means basically if I were to show a graph that said here, here's H and here's B, right? That means that there should be some relationship like this, right? Where the slope of this is mu. The thing that's weird is that usually for a lot of magnetic materials, it's not that linear. It kind of dozes off, all right? For a real magnetic material, it, does, it tends to look like that. I'm not going to worry about that so much right now. All right, I want to get the main points across. What do I call this mu here? Permeability. 
Right. Permittivity, permittivity is close. It's the one I get for electric fields, right? This guy is what I call permeability. And in general, the smallest value you can ever have, if I'm in free space, if I was in air, what's what's mu equal to? Mu naught, yeah, which is four pi times 10 to the minus seventh. Okay, so in general, what I say is that mu is a mu relative times mu naught, all right? And so in this class, we're going to worry about kind of the, the two things. So the permeability of free space, all right? If you're paying attention, that's four pi times 10 to the minus seven Henry's per meter. All right, don't need to worry about that too much, but let's, it's four pi times 10 to the minus seven. And then there is this relative permeability. And I wrote it down here for a couple of, of good magnetic material. Well, some of them are good magnetic materials. Air and copper, for instance, are not good magnetic materials. In other words, the copper in that motor is not a magnetic material. What's the copper in the motor for? Just to conduct the electricity, let the electrons go in and go out, all right? To conduct, and I'm gonna use the word conduct, to conduct the magnetic field, I use a ferrite material or an iron. And this tells me that the mu relative is a couple of thousand times more than air. So it's good, but not great, okay? That's gonna to lead to an analogy that we're gonna make here in a minute, all right? <clears throat> but that this, that this guy is, is good at carrying fields, but not great at carrying fields, all right? So um, Ampere's law, we're gonna get rid of the calculus of this whole thing. So it's, wow, okay, H dot DS equals J dot DA. What the heck did I just write there in words? What's that tell me? There's current densities and areas, H fields. It tells me basically if I took a surface like this piece of paper, okay, and if I had a current coming up through that paper, there would be an H field where around the edge of it, right? So basically, if the if the edge of it is is this what I call contour C, and this hatch thing would be the surface S. So I've got a current going up through the surface S. My right-hand rule here tells me that the field would be going that direction, okay? And if the current went the other way, the field would go the other direction. So basically a current through this surface creates a field around the edge. Turns out we're gonna make a big simplification to this, all right? A nice big simplification to this. It says, if I've got a current, <clears throat> That's going to create a field. That field is going to create a flux, and that's going to make things. And it would be a very simple way of thinking about it. All right, Faraday's law. I didn't even bother putting in the calculus for that one. All right, Faraday's law basically tells me that at these terminals, there's going to be a. If there is a deflux by dt, okay, where flux. I defined as. B dot DA, all right, through this, this guy has a surface S, like that, all right. Then there will be a voltage at those terminals. And I don't know, I'd get in trouble with the fields, guys, because it's the integral of E dot DS equals negative yeah yeah we can get into all sorts of stuff like that but bottom line is i get a voltage at those terminals if i have a changing flux okay all right then there is this gauss's law thing mr divergence right so b dot da is equal to zero this guy basically tells me that field lines are if i take a surface there is no net field ever leaving that surface and that leads to the statement there's no there's no magnetic charges so no monopoles if i if i have a magnetic field it always leaves and comes back okay charges that's not the case field just leaves a charge don't need to get too lost in all those in all those details for right now okay all right this guy turns out to be useful to me later it's actually a statement of something i'm going to call kcl right in a second all right, so let's let's deal with this notion of flux for a second. Because flux is exactly, flux is to 
magnetic things as charge is to electric things, okay? So if I have a capacitor, right? I put a voltage on a capacitor, which has a capacitance C. How much charge is stored in that capacitor? What's the charge stored on that capacitor? Q equals C times V. I put a voltage on it, and it gives me a charge Q. Inductor is going to be the same thing. I'm going to put a current I, and it's going to give me a flux lambda. All right, we're going to get to that in a second. All right. So here's what we typically have, right? I have something like this guy right here. I got a, I got a coil that's sitting in a magnetic field. And what I do is, is I say that this guy, so in general, the flux is this, all right? The integral over the surface of B dot dA. First of all, if B is not changing and the area is not, not changing, right? What I can say about this is it's just simply B dot a, like that, okay, B dot A. Now, that means it's still a vector, but it's just numbers. There's no calculus going on here, right? So in the picture that I've drawn here, what would be, I don't know, I guess, I guess in terms of the way I've drawn this, let's say this is the Y direction and this is the X direction, right? The B field that I've drawn and, and the A, the area vector. So this area vector, so I defined it here. It's, it's a direction perpendicular to the plane, okay? So it's perpendicular to the plane. So notice what I said is I got this surface S right here. This is the surface. And the area vector is normal to it or perpendicular to it, okay? It could change with time, but this, this is an integral with respect to space, all right? We're never going to do integrals. At least I don't, we, we may at some point briefly, all right, when I derive something later on in the semester. But you guys aren't probably going to get problems where you do integrals like this. So B dot dA like this is what I'm going to get because B is not varying spatially. Could be varying with time, all right, but it's not varying spatially, in which case the integral goes away. So how would I write this in general? If I have a dot product, how would I write that? The magnitude of B times the magnitude of the area times what? Cosine of the angle between them. Cosine, not C, O, cosine of theta. All right, like that. Cosine of the angle between them. So what's the angle between B and A as I've drawn it right there? Zero. Because the B field, right? The B field and the area vector are perfectly aligned with each other. So in general, if I took a, took something like this, right? I did it two ways here. So in this case, phi equals B times A. B is going, so B is going this direction. The area vector is going that direction. So phi equals whatever the magnitude of B is times whatever the area of the coil is, okay? If I flipped it around 180 degrees, what do I get? It's negative, okay? When it's 90 degrees, what do I get? Zero. If I turned it to some something else, it's B times A times the cosine of the angle between them, all right? So let's see if we can see that. That's what I, so I wanted to see, how would I measure flux? What did I do? You don't know what I did. What do you think I did? I don't know why you're going to see this, but switch over. All right, so what did I do? Not DVD, got cam, there we go. All right, so I got a coil here, all right? And one of my coils is getting this voltage. That's an AC voltage, right? Now, <clears throat> I got another coil, right? So if I get this other coil, I'm going to stick them right on top of each other. What's going to happen on the other coil? I got a, I got a terminal on one of these coils. What's going to happen when I put it right on top? What do you notice about the blue line there on my oscilloscope? So I'm, 
So the, the yellow is what I'm putting into one of the coils and I'm dropping the other coil right on top of it. So if you see the sandwich there, they're right on top of each other. So there's the blue and there's the yellow. What's happening on the blue? There's a voltage at the terminals because there's a changing flux. There's a deflux by DT going through that thing. So what's gonna happen if I turn this guy 180 degrees? So in other words, right now they're like this. What's gonna happen if I take the one coil and turn it 180 degrees? See the opposite, right? Because that A vector, okay, so it's shifted. And you can see there, there they are now. Notice that it changed. What's gonna happen when I go to 90 degrees? In other words, if I sit them like, if I sit one on top of the other, but at a 90 degree angle to each other, not gonna be anything. There they are sitting on top of each other. I don't see anything. So what do I do? If I turn this guy and put it like this, they line up nice. Turn it 90 degrees, it gets pretty bad. Turn it 180 degrees, they're out of phase with each other by 180 degrees. All right, so this is how I'm basically, one of these guys is creating a magnetic field and I'm putting the other one into that magnetic field. Now, one other question to, to us here, right? If I look at those two things, right? These coils look pretty identical, don't they? I mean, I, don't, I mean, I could be tricking you, right? But I mean, they look like they're pretty identical, right? So you guys know about transformers, right? What's, what's supposed to be, if I have voltage, if I have two coils that I stack on top of each other like this, right? What's supposed to be, if this guy's a transformer, what's supposed to be true about the voltage of the two terminals of two identical coils? Should be the same, they're not. Why not? Because the flux that one of them is creating is not fully making it through the other guy. So how can I, so this, this guy down here, this is the one that's making a field, right? He's got a voltage source hooked up to him. There's a current going through there. It's making a field. How can I make sure that all the flux, all the field made by this guy goes through the other coil? How can I make sure that all of it goes through there? So let's just, let's, let me step back for a second too. If I've got a coil, Let's see if you guys remember this from fields, right? It was a bad coil. Oh, yeah, I switched over. Sorry. Oh, you have to like double to one. Well, it's it should be one to one, right? Let's well, let's just yeah, let's let's take if I have a current I going into this thing, where's there's a field created inside this guy. Where's the field inside that coil? It runs through the middle of it, right? And if I and I I guess if I did this with a current going in like that, then the field would go like that, it would run through the middle. Now what's it do? It sort of fringes off and then comes back like that, right? That's not what I want to have happen. If I'm creating a field with one coil and I want it all to go through the other one, I don't want it to fringe off like that. I wanna force it up into the other coil. So what's this guy gonna do? So here, let's, well, so, I want to make sure that all of the field from one coil goes into the other one. So what I, I got this guy and this guy. What are these? That's magnetic material. It's not magnets. It's just magnetic material. These are basically, this is just like you would see if you look at a transformer. These are sheets of copper that are put together, not copper, sheets of, of iron that are put together. And I put them into, basically into a loop. All right, so now I'm going to put one of these guys onto here, and I'm going to put the other guy on here, and it should be good. It worked out perfectly when I did it before. Now it's not going to work for me. That should work out for you. All right. <clears throat> That's really frustrating. When I get these two guys, there we go. All right. <laughs> Just like your lab? Yeah. yeah. Part of it is, is how well I'm aligning the, the coils. They should be when I press them together earlier. There will notice it's getting better though. If I think that I close this guy down, 
It's going to bother me before between now and Wednesday. If I line those two together, it should become one to one. All right. I did it in my office earlier. It was one to one. Part of the reason, part of the reason why it's probably not, I suspect, is because the other thing I did was I took my quick clamp to make sure that it was really squeezed pretty tight. All right. That is one thing that's special is that, that, that these two pieces have to get squeezed down pretty tight. All right. There's a lot going on here, but the key thing, it's really not that complicated. Right. Basically, the the couple of core concepts that we're dealing with here is this idea of magnetic flux, which is total, total how much total field I have going through a coil. Okay. And then a concept of what this B field is. Okay. Now, if I asked you to compute what the B field is, you guys learned a method for doing that um, in um, fields, right? If I said I wanted to, so let's say I had a coil wire. So basically I did, I did this, all right? This is, this is what you would see for a pretty typical inductor, right? So what I have is this, this particular material here is what I call ferrite, all right? So it's a magnesium uh, copper mix is what this is. But it's pretty common to use, and I put windings around this guy. Okay. So that's what I'm what I have in. So it looks like a donut. Sometimes you call it a donut. It's a toroid, is the term that they use for it. Let's say I got a coil that I wrap around this guy like that. And I have a current I going into that. Now, where is if this guy, I'm gonna say right here. This material that I've got, let's say, I'm going to say it's mu is very big. Very often, I'm going to say that it's mu is so big that it's almost infinite. All right. Now, where's the H field going to be? I use Ampere's law to find the H field, right? Where's the H field going to be if I have a coil? So, I, yeah, I can use my right hand rule. So, if I got a current going in, all right, so the, if the current's going in that way, I can figure out where the H field will be. Where is the H field going to be? Now I can do a couple of different things. I draw Ampere's law basically was H dot DS equals the total current coming up through the surface. Okay, so basically what I what I do is I draw something like this. Here's my surface. And the dashed line is the contour, all right? So how much, this is J dot, J dot DA like that, okay? So in terms of this, if I had, um, if I'm looking at a coil like this, I have a current that goes down and around and then back and then back. So if I look at this here, I'd have current coming up through that surface like this, and then down over here. How much, where is the field going to be? So the way you would have learned this in fields is you would have said, okay, I draw that surface inside here, then I draw it in the middle of the toroid, and then I draw another one on the outside. Okay, very bad picture. But if I look at this, where's all the field going to be? So let's let's draw it like this. Let's let's think of the. I think it's important to at least do this once. We're not going to do these calculations once. But let's say I did. Here's the surface S. All right, and here's ooh, here's the contour C around the edge of it. If my wires are over here. How much total current's cutting through that surface? In other words, just from a picture perspective, right? Maybe this is easier if you guys don't think through. If I'm looking at this, what I what I'm showing is if I had the surface S on the inside of this donut, how much if my surface was like right here, how much how many wires are going through that? If this guy was smaller than the inner diameter, the surface I'm talking about, if it was smaller than the inner diameter of this thing. There'd be no current going through it, okay? If there's no current coming through a surface, how much H field is around the edge? 
zero. Okay. Similarly, if I drew the surface so it enclosed the whole thing, how much total current is enclosed by that? Oh, sorry. So if I drew it around the outside, so here's the wires over here. How much total current is going through that surface? In other words, if I drew this guy, this, right? So if the surface enclosed somewhere outside of this ring, how much total current would be going through that? So let's think, I've got a current going down here and up here and then down here and then up on this side. So how much total current goes through that surface? So I have some, again, so into the page here, out of the page here, into the page here, out of the page here. What's the total current penetrating this surface S? Well, I have I times N coming up and I have I times N going down. So basically I have a current coming up, right? If I think, if I think about the way this guy is, I got a current going up here, down here. So if I drew a surface, that enclosed this whole thing, the net current would be what? Zero, right? So where is all the field? It's inside the donut. And basically what I say is, if I look at that, if I drew my surface like I did in this picture, what's the total current going through this surface? If there's N turns, it's N times I, right? So the H field goes around the outside edge like that. Okay, and I got to be careful about my directions here. Yeah, that's the right direction. If my current is going into the page, if I do the right hand rule, that means that it's the H field's going around like this. All right, now I want to figure out what that H field is before I stop. How do I figure out what that H field is? I had this guy H dot ds equals the total current going through there. So I call that N times I. Now I defined a couple of things about this guy, right? So here's something that's gonna make some of you guys uncomfortable. Those of you who like to be exact, magnetics is kind of an unexact thing, right? I made this, so I, I said this donut here, I said this guy had a width W and a radius R, right? And I said that R is much, much bigger than W. If I say R is much, much bigger than W, what am I, what am I assuming when I do that? I'm basically saying that this, that this donut is skinny, basically a circle. Yeah. Right. And I'm going to basically say that there's no variation from in, as I go from here to here. So I'm basically just going to say that this H dot DS becomes really simple and becomes H times the length of this contour right there. What would the length of that contour be? If W is really, really skinny, the length of that guy would be two pi R. And that's equal to N times I. So my H equals N I over two pi R. Now, that's a, that's a term we're gonna use a lot. Sometimes this guy right here, this two pi R, is sometimes what I call my magnetic length. All right, we're gonna talk about that more on, on, on Wednesday. All right, notice this guy has units of amps per meter. Okay, without me going any further, what's the, how would I get the, how would I get the B field here? Yeah, B would be mu times H. Okay, how do I get the flux? Real quick, how do I get the flux? I want to pick up with this on Wednesday. It would be, yeah, the flux going through that core would be B times A. What A am I talking about? The area of this guy. So I'd have to look at the side of it, right? If I look at the side of that guy, that would be mu times H times pi times W over two squared. Okay. So in other words, if this guy has a width W, 
Now notice when I calculated the length around here, I ignored the W, but I didn't when I did this. All right, that's a that's the type of thing we're gonna do a lot on these problems. All right. Once I get the flux, I can convert that to an actual inductance. All right. The key thing we're gonna do is just I, I just introduced this. There's turns out to be a much simpler way to do it than doing the calculus like this, which is to say that that if I have a current, a current produces a flux, just like a voltage source produces a current in a circuit. What's gonna happen in this thing is I'm gonna produce a I'm gonna have a current that's gonna produce a flux in a magnetic circuit. All right, and then I, I have a simpler way to kind of look at this. All right, so we'll look at that more on, on Wednesday.